Good morning and welcome to St. Martin's Church Dorking for our 10 o'clock Eucharist service, our Holy Communion on this third Sunday of Epiphany. My name is Derek and I would like to welcome you here to worship with us, whether this is your first time joining us online or whether you have become a regular worshipper with us. Either way, we are really delighted that you have chosen to join with us. We are gathering today online in all sorts of different places to meet with God in our worship, to hear the scriptures read, to give praise to God in our hymns, and to commune with God in our prayer. And for our sermon today, we will be joining the Bishop of Guildford, the Right Reverend Andrew Watson. Our service will be beginning in just a few moments, so let's be still for a short while and quieten our busy minds, remembering that whatever we are right now, we are nevertheless in the presence of God. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. We begin our worship today with our prayer of preparation. Join me as together we say, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you 
and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy, your Son proclaimed good news to the poor, release to the captives, and freedom to the oppressed. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit, and set all your people free to praise you in Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Our first reading today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Kedulayama and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 128. Blessed are all those who fear the Lord and walk in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the toil of your hands. It shall go well with you and happy shall you be. Your wife within your house shall be like a fruitful vine, your children round your table like fresh olive branches. Thus shall the one be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord from out of Zion bless you, that you may see Jerusalem in prosperity all the days of your life. May you see your children's children and may there be peace upon Israel. O Christ, our true vine, may we, your branches, be ever fruitful in your service and share your love and peace with all your children in the power of the Spirit and to the glory of the Father. Amen. Our second reading is from the New Testament book of the Revelation, chapter 19, and beginning to read at the sixth verse. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Alleluia, alleluia. Christ was revealed in flesh, proclaimed among the nations, and believed in throughout the world. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now it's time for our sermon. And today we go across to Willow Grange and Bishop Andrew. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Father, speak through your word this day, we pray, as we seek to live life in all its fullness, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Saturday, June the 13th, 2015, was the best of days for the Watson family. At 7.30 a.m. I was putting on a new suit and tie. At 8 a.m. I was inspecting the marquee in our garden. At 9 a.m. I was making coffee for my daughter Hannah and her bridesmaids as their hair was being cut and their makeup applied. At 1 p.m. I was proudly walking Hannah down the aisle. Their church was in the East End of London, where Hannah had directed the music for the past three years. So at the end of a joyful service, people piled onto a huge coach to take them to the reception in our garden. Various members of a very multicultural congregation hadn't quite registered that they weren't invited to the reception, but climbed on board the coach anyway. So that we hastily had to make up a number of extra placemats to make sure they felt included. And as Hannah and Peter welcomed everyone into the garden, and as we streamed into the marquee for food and speeches, followed by a Cayley on the lawn by moonlight, it really was the best of days for the Watson family. The wine, I'm glad to report, didn't run out, and nor did the food, nor the locally produced hog's back beer. In fact, there was plenty left over at the end of the day. The only problem was our water tank which found it hard to cope with quite so much washing and flushing as our guests variously came in to use the facilities. It seems a little ironic, in fact, looking at that event through the spectacles of today's Gospel reading, that there was plenty of wine, but we ran out of water. Had Jesus been there in person, we would have had him praying over the plumbing. There are memories that have come to the fore at the beginning of 2021. Not least because two more of our children are due to get married this year, COVID permitting, 
and our house is currently awash with talk of caterers, bridesmaids and all the trimmings, not to mention the port which might help us to avoid making the same mistake twice. Unless I've looked through the relevant photo album, and indeed the album of Beverly and my wedding too, in a year that also celebrates my 60th birthday, our 35th wedding anniversary, and God willing, the birth of our first grandchild in March. So it struck me afresh how deep seriousness and deep joy are two sides of the same coin. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death us do part. You could hardly get a more serious, potentially sacrificial or open-ended commitment than that, the kind of thing that any sensible lawyer would caution us against with some vigour. But at this point of the deepest seriousness, the Cayley by Moonlight seems wholly appropriate too. Indeed, Saturday, June the 13th, 2015, was the most joyous of days as two special young people with a shared faith and deeply in love committed themselves to one another, whatever life might throw at them. Deep joy and deep seriousness. The two come together at the best of baptisms too, and even the best of funerals, as in amidst the tears we celebrate a life well lived and rejoice that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Outside the context of the Christian faith, the two are very hard to reconcile, which is why so many still turn to the church to mark the beginning of life and its end and the covenant of marriage in between, the occasional offices as they are known in the trade, or more colloquially, hatching, matching and dispatching. And the word we use that combine both this deep seriousness and deep joy is the word awe. To come together in the presence of the living God, especially in these life-defining moments, is nothing short of awe-inspiring, awesome. Awe. It lies at the heart of our Old Testament reading this morning, where fresh from Abraham's victories over some local chieftains, a mysterious figure called Melchizedek visited the patriarch with gifts of bread and wine and blessed him before Abraham gave him a tenth of all he had. This Melchizedek was both the king of Jerusalem and the so-called priest of the God Most High. And he shows up again in Psalm 110 and most famously in the letter to the Hebrews, whose author sees him as a forerunner of Christ, the King of Kings and our great high priest, to whom even Abraham brings his tithe. The Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 just like Isaiah's suffering servant or Zechariah's king riding on a donkey is an awesome epiphany of Jesus, complete with deep seriousness and deep joy, many hundreds of years before those angels appeared to the shepherds with their message of the birth of a saviour who is Christ the Lord. Awe. It lies at the heart of our reading from the book of Revelation too, though this time the epiphany is in the far-off future rather than the distant past. There's deep joy in this passage, as those choirs of angels set off once again, proclaiming that the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns, and announcing the wedding feast of the Lamb. But there's deep seriousness too. For this Lamb is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb is the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb who reminds us that both joy and sacrifice lie at the very heart of agape love. And so this extraordinary heavenly wedding feast, where Christ and his church are drawn together into an eternal covenant of love, is the most awe-inspiring of visions, an epiphany of epiphanies, the culmination of God's great story of salvation for the world that he loves so much. And from the distant past and the far-off future to the witness of the first Christians to the epiphany they experienced in their own day, for all similarly characterises our Gospel reading today in the midst of its human dilemmas and homely setting. In Jesus' day, weddings were a huge village and community event, with everyone expected metaphorically to climb on the coach and make their way to the reception. 
It reminds me of a conversation I recently had with a Ugandan bishop who'd held a party in honour of his daughter's marriage, which was attended by no fewer than 4,000 people from his extended family and the villages round about. And Jesus was among those villagers here in Galilee, and the wine had run out, and it was all very embarrassing. And although there was some initial reluctance on Jesus' part to respond to the crisis, a desire perhaps not to stick his head above the parapet too early, because the moment he did so, he would find himself shot at by the religious and political establishment of his day, Jesus eventually accepted his mother's invitation. In one sense, it was John the Baptist who launched Jesus' public ministry during his baptism in the River Jordan. But in another, it was Mary, his mother. The English in our Gospel reading sounds rather ruder and more abrupt than the original Greek. Woman, what concern is that to you and me? But it's clear from this passage that Mary plays her part in releasing Jesus into the compassionate, transformational ministry that was to be his hallmark over the next few years. In the previous chapter, Jesus had promised Nathanael that he would see heaven descending to earth. And here were the first fruits of that promise, a very large quantity of water being turned into a very large quantity of extraordinarily good wine. John's Gospel, of course, is full of symbols, of clues, like the best and most important of all treasure hunts. John tells us that this was on the third day, which points us forward to the biggest transformation of all later in the Gospel story, not just water into wine, but death into life, as Jesus' battered, bloody body was raised to life on the third day. He records those words, My hour has not yet come which will later culminate in the words, now the hour has come, just as Jesus was carted off for his execution. The gallons of wine remind us of joy and celebration, the wine of the kingdom on the one hand, but also of Jesus' blood, the sacrifice through which that joy would be released on the other. And when John writes about the six great water jars, which were used for the Jewish rites of purification, He's reminding us that the new wine of the gospel first emerged within the Jewish religion, but also that that religion was incomplete up to this point, that Abraham paid tribute to the king of kings and great high priest who was greater than he, just six water jars, when seven was the Jewish number of completion. The simple fact that Jesus was at a wedding feast at all, a party, picks up another gospel theme. The criticism that the religious leaders were often to level against Jesus, that while John the Baptist spent most of his time fasting and praying, and while they themselves spent most of the time in church and with like-minded people, Jesus parted too much. He spent too long in the company of dodgy characters. He was, quote, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In reply, Jesus would point out that he was like a doctor, and the doctors had to be accessible to their patients if they were truly to affect healing and transformation. But awe, once again, lies at the heart of this reading, with the dual symbolism of those hundreds of gallons of wine speaking once more of the deeper seriousness and the deepest joy. And that's what C.S. Lewis was getting at in the quotation with which I started this sermon. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That's our challenge as followers of one who was and is and is to come, as disciples of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. And that's our calling as we seek ourselves to be little epiphanies in our generation, not least in this most challenging of times in our generation, letting our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. A cynical or trivial or uncommitted approach to life is not worthy of children of the King of Kings. 
We are called instead to give ourselves to a life that is awesome, a life that draws together the deepest seriousness and the deepest joy, truly life in all its fullness. And it all begins when, like the servants at that wedding feast in Cana of Galilee all those years ago, we respond to the words of the mother of Jesus, do whatever he tells you. Amen. And now let us declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So now we have a short time of prayer. Let us pray. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us by prayer and intercession make our request to God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, let us be filled with the power of your Spirit. Let us accept you in our lives as truth to be spoken, as life to be lived, as light to be shared, as love to be followed, as joy to be given, as peace to be spread around, as sacrifice to be offered among our friends, neighbours and all people. And give us courage to renew our covenant with God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father God, in whose love we live and move, we pray for a world crying out to be filled, loved, wanted and cherished. We pray for a world that thinks less of others than of self. A world where division between nations, race, religion, neighbour and family lead to distrust. We pray for a world that needs to know your love, your hope, your peace, your joy and your salvation. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, we pray for our churches of St. Martin, St. Mary's and St. Barnabas. And today we remember in our CTD cycle of prayers, St. Paul's in Dorking. Bless our worship here. Strengthen us in our mission and guide us in your love. Be with our ministers as they lead us in our praise of you. And we pray for all members of our community. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, we bring to you the sufferings of those we hold dear, the struggle of those trying to cope with no home to go to, the pains of the sick, both at home, in hospital and in care homes, the loneliness of the elderly and frail. In your great mercy, bring them comfort, relief and reassurance that you are always with them in all their troubles. We bring to you today, John Irvings, Rowan Nunnery, Brian Smith, Alan Tye, 
Angela Cole, Barry and Rosie Pegram, Judy Palmer, Paul Burning, Renate McLennan, and all those known only in our hearts. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. We remember before God those who have died and pray for all those who are going through the darkest darkness of loss and bereavement. Father, we thank you for the promise of eternal life and the hope of glory and commend to you your everlasting love and care, Rosie Newland and all those who have died. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us that we may abide in you and live in your love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Saviour Christ is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks because in the incarnation of the word, a new light has dawned on the world that all the nations may be brought out of darkness 
to see the radiance of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, Rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, may your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, for he is alive and reigns, now and forever. Amen. Join me in praying together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
this third Sunday of Epiphany, our act of worship is drawing to a close. And as always, I offer my thanks to the musicians of St. Martin in the Fields, Trafalgar Square, for their choral offerings in this service. I also thank you for joining with us today from wherever you might be, whatever time you might be joining us, for being a part of this act of worship. I hope that one day very soon we will meet face to face in this building of St. Martin's Dorking. So in the meanwhile, I leave you with this blessing. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.